All right. I hope you're following along at home, and if you have your Bibles or maybe your tablets, um, be careful not to X out of the browser that's carrying the live stream, but go ahead and go to the NRSV version. That's the version I'm going to be using. I'll be in Luke chapter 12, and I just want to begin before you know we enter into the sermon uh, with a word of thanks. I want to thank our ministry staff for working so hard this week. You know, there's so much that happens that you don't see on a Sunday. Um, we have ministers who are looking out for those that they care for. We have ministers who are uh, doing daily devotionals on our website. We have ministers that are checking in on folks. And I am just so proud of this team that I work with. But it's not just the ministry staff. It's also our admin staff. I'm talking about Jamie Eggleston and Liz Moore and Davey, David Underwood and Tracy McElroy and Dora Fuentes. You know, all, all of these people that make Highland Oaks run week in and week out that you may not see on Sunday morning. I just want to say a special thank you to them. But I also want to say a last thank you to our shepherds, our elders, who have reached out and made phone calls and that are, are really trying hard to take care of their flocks. You know, that, that's the difference in being an elder and being a shepherd because this is a time where shepherds need to look after their sheep. And I am so grateful to have uh, shepherding couples that really do care about the sheep and their flock. So be encouraged that we are with you. We are still looking for ways to be helpful. And as I said before, I don't know how much longer this is going to go on, but what I do know is that God is faithful and the church will survive whatever crisis comes our way. So you've already heard the reading of the word. I just want to pray over that word and then we will enter into uh, just a, a, a season of listening to see what God might have to say to us for this time and for this place. So let's pray. God, thank you once again for your words that have stood the test of time, words that bring us comfort in times of any crisis that we face. And God, right now, our country and our world is facing an unbelievable crisis. So we pray against fear. We pray against anything that keeps us from loving you and loving other people to our fullest extent. But God, we believe that these words uh, that you've entrusted to us point us to you, point us back to you and the one that gives us uh, as we sing uh, a blessed assurance. So God, may you pour through me the gift of teaching and of story and of preaching this morning, for it's in your name that I pray. Amen. When I was in the fifth grade, there was a song that took our nation by storm. But it wasn't just a song that took our nation by storm. It became the campaign theme song for George H.W. Bush's re-election campaign. And it also became the anthem for a Caribbean island that's in crisis. And it came from a movie starring Tom Cruise. It's a song that I'm sure has probably come to mind even over these past few weeks by the great Bobby McFerrin, Don't Worry, Be Happy. I'm going to spare you singing this song because this is the kind of song that gets stuck in your head for days on end. But here's what's interesting about the song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Bobby McFerrin didn't write this song. He actually stole the phrase, don't worry, be happy, from a spiritual leader in the country of India named Mahir Baba. And Mahir Baba was an Indian spiritualist that really helped people understand that the greatest version of God was when God was best personified in you. And as long as you could develop this sense of peace, this sense of calm, then that was who God was. In other words, God was completely dependent on you. 
And he would actually sign letters like the ones you see on your screen right now. Don't worry, be happy. And what Bobby McFerrin did is he saw that and he was attracted to that slogan. And so like any good Church of Christ musical lyricist would do, he created this a cappella version of this great song that stayed on the pop charts for several weeks. George Carlin, the, the great comedian, heard this song and said, that is exactly the kind of mindless philosophy Americans would buy into. Don't worry, be happy. But it's not just a mindless philosophy. It's something that Jesus would disagree with. I wish life were as simple as simply saying or singing, don't worry, be happy. But it's more than that. Jesus invites us into this place that's not just about a carefree attitude, but Jesus invites us not to not worry and be happy, but rather don't worry and be hopeful. You see, there's a difference in simply being happy and being hopeful because Jesus invites us into a space, into a kingdom that's not dependent on us, but rather is dependent on God. It's God's world. It is God that holds the world in his hands. This is about God, not about us, which leads us to our text in Luke this morning, Luke's invitation. Don't worry, be hopeful. Jesus is teaching. If you look over in chapter 12, it even begins this way. Jesus was teaching the crowds by the thousands so that they even trampled on one another. Can you imagine being in such a mob of people longing to hear what someone was saying that you're trampling one another? But Jesus turns and began to speak first to his disciples. Now, see, that's an interesting turn that Luke makes in the telling of his story, that when Jesus is looking not at the crowds, but really at his disciples, he's inviting them to lean in and to focus and to listen to these words, to this invitation to not worry. And then Jesus tells them not to worry about the Pharisees that could kill their body, but they could never kill their soul. Jesus tells them, don't worry about needing to defend yourself because the Holy Spirit is going to give you words to defend yourself. Over and over again, Jesus is telling those closest to him, those who are following him, look, God has got this. But then there's an interesting turn in the story where uh, someone in the crowd, Luke says, pipes up and says, Jesus, I need you to tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And don't you think that's an interesting thing for Luke to include while Jesus is talking to his disciples? Somebody just interrupts him out in the crowd and says, Jesus, I really wish you would tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Well, it is a bit odd, but the reason why you would want someone to divide the inheritance with you is because you're fearful that there's not going to be enough. And so you're doing everything you can to self-preserve and to gather as much stuff as you can because you are terrified of the unknown. Even in the midst of Jesus instructing his disciples, don't worry, God's got this. Even the Holy Spirit is going to come and give you words that you may not even have. Somebody raises their hand and says, but Jesus, please, I still need the things that I deserve most. Boy, can we ever relate to that over these last two weeks? Have you been to the store? Well, I'm sure you've been to the store. We don't just have a crisis because of a virus. We have a crisis because there is no toilet paper. I mean, my goodness gracious, this is unbelievable. It's crazy. It's like, hey, stock up for, you know, a few weeks, even 30 days. You would think that people had toilet paper for three years. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable how much people are hoarding and trying to self 
preserved, which is why I think Jesus tells a story about a man. It's a parable who builds a bigger barn. And Jesus says, really? Do you think that's what my kingdom is all about? Of course, that's my paraphrase. That's not the words of Jesus. But Jesus is saying, look, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's the context for Jesus giving this invitation to not worry. It stands in stark contrast to gathering things up for yourself. It stands in stark contrast to fretting over what somebody can do to you or what something can do to you. It stands in stark contrast to what the nations run after, which is why I love what Jesus says there in verse 31. Instead, strive for God's kingdom, and all of these things will be added to you. It's a matter of striving for God, not for yourself. So Jesus says, don't worry. You know, that word worry is a really interesting Greek word. Uh, Jesus actually says, do not marin not owe. In, in other words, don't marum not owe. And you're thinking, well, that's great. What does that mean? Well, aren't you glad I'm going to tell you? This Greek word for worry actually means to be pulled apart. To, to be torn away. It's not about an attitude. It's about a direction that you're headed. So really what Jesus is saying is don't be pulled away into what the world considers important. Don't be torn apart from my kingdom. Remember who's on the throne. And guess what Jesus says? It's not you. And that's why Jesus is able to say, look at the lilies of the field. Look at the ravens in the air. God cares about them, but he cares about you more. Don't be pulled away from believing that God doesn't care about you. God is with you. Is that not the greatest promise throughout the story of Scripture? Is that not Jesus' name, Emmanuel? God is with us. Is that not how the story of Scripture even ends? That God is with you? So Jesus says, don't worry. Don't be pulled apart. I don't know if you had the blessing of having a parent sing to you when you were a child, but it never ceases to amaze me how all four of our boys had a particular song. But, but it's not so much the song that amazed me, it's how they continued to long to hear that song so they could go to sleep. And I wonder sometimes if, we need to be reminded that the songs we sing aren't just words, but they're anthems that are written on our hearts to assure us, as we sang right before the message started, that God is sovereign. I, I love the song, He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. You remember that song? He's got the whole world in His hands. He's got the whole world in his hands he's got the whole world in his hands he's got the whole world in his hands and then you would sing he's got the little bitty baby in his hands and we sing that song and we need to be reminded it's not just a song it's an invitation to trust that god has the whole world in his hands there's not a crisis, there's not a disease, there's not a virus, there's not a death that God can't handle. And this is more than an instruction Jesus is giving. This is an invitation to believe what Jesus is saying. It's not a matter of accepting that the world is as it is. It's rather a matter of being allegiant to the way things will be and can be if God is on the throne. 
So I want to leave you with, with two just brief reminders and maybe even phrases that you can use as we continue in this lockdown and this quarantine in your home. And, and I want us to really think about what it means to strive after God's kingdom. Once again, Jesus says, don't keep striving for what you to eat and drink and keep worrying for it's the nations of the world that strive after these things but instead strive for God's kingdom what does this look like well, well two things first I think it looks like striving for God's sovereignty which should lead us to say this God's got this when you strive for God's sovereignty, you can say with full confidence, God's got this. You see, the disciples are reminded of this constantly as they follow Jesus. Do you remember earlier in chapter 7 when they were in the boat and they were sailing across to the other side of the region of the Gerasenes? And a great storm swelled and the water began coming into the boat and they woke Jesus up and Jesus gets up and rebukes the winds of the wave. And then he looks at the disciples and he says, where is your faith? You know, I always heard that as a condemnation from Jesus. Like as he was rebuking the winds and the waves, he was rebuking the disciples. But what if it wasn't a rebuke, but rather it was a reminder? Where is your faith, disciples? I've got this. And even if you look at the feeding of the 5,000, I love this story because Jesus is teaching, and I'm sure he's exhausted. The disciples come to him and say, Jesus, there are like 5,000 men here in addition to all of their families. They need something to eat. Send them home. And you remember what Jesus says? Disciples, why don't you give them something to eat? And I can imagine the disciples thinking, this guy has lost his mind. But Jesus once again says, just tell me what you have. Tell me what you have. And then, of course, you know the story. There's just a few baskets of fish and of bread. And Jesus once again takes it and says, I've got this. Even in the story of the transfiguration when Jesus leads his closest friends up to a mountain and there before him is Moses and Elijah and the disciples are terrified. They are scared to death. But do you remember what the voice says coming from heaven? This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Why? Because Jesus has got this. Friends, Striving after God's sovereignty, after God's kingdom means that God's got this. That needs to be our posture in the world, no matter what we face. And I am so thankful for us here at the Highland Oaks Church that we have so many examples of people who demonstrate to us that God's got this. You know who I thought about when I was reflecting on this message and, and who we might need to hear a word from? about how God's got this. Let me show you a picture. I, I love this moment in our church family of when our dear friend, Aubrey McNutt, who was suffering, suffering from cancer, came onto the stage and I wanted to interview him because there was such a, a faithfulness that he had that, that I wanted to lean into because more than anything, Aubrey reminded me through his suffering, through his sickness, that God's got this. And one of the things you might not know or maybe you didn't remember is that Aubrey purchased 200 books with his own money because he was so convinced that God had him that he wanted everyone to know that God mattered more than anything else. And the book that Aubrey bought for everybody was Rick Warren's book, Not the Purpose Driven Life, but God Has a Plan for You. God's got this. And I think that's the testimony the church can give, especially to our neighbors, especially to those we interact with. We don't strive for the things the world strives for. We strive for God's kingdom. Why? Because God's got this. I'm grateful for Aubrey 
in so many faithful saints who have walked these halls, who have walked this space and served as living and former reminders that God's got this. But it's not just about God's sovereignty, it's also about God's space, which is why Jesus talks about the kingdom of God. It's almost as if Jesus is inviting us to say, not only do I have this, but God's in this. God's in this. Why? Because God is about heaven. And, and you may think that heaven is this place you go to after you die, but I think Jesus would beg to differ that it's not just about a place, a place that is somewhere in the future, but it's also a place that's very here and now. It's a place where God's space invades every fabric of our being. You know, the Gospel of Matthew uses not the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of heaven. And I think that's interesting because... Matthew was, of course, writing to Jewish people, trying to remind the Jewish people that their religion was a lot more about a relationship, a relationship that lied deep within them, within their hearts. And Jesus was saying, look, God's not only got this, but God is in this. Isn't that what we pray in the Lord's Prayer, every single Sunday as we're dismissed, one of our shepherds gets up and says, now I'd like to not recite the Lord's Prayer, but we are going to pray the Lord's Prayer. We are going to say with great confidence and assurance, oh God, your kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. That's not a plea to take us away from, from where we are now, but rather to bring us closer to where we are are now closer to God because God is in this that is why Jesus performs healings that's why Jesus does miracles that's why Jesus invited his disciples to follow him because in following him Jesus was leading those disciples into God's space I think that's a foretaste of what was to come which is why Jesus was able to invite those earliest disciples into a space of not worrying, to not being pulled apart by what the world strives after. Why? Because God's in this. God can be in the midst of death. God can be in the midst of depression. God can be in the midst of uncertainty. God can be in the midst of fear. God's in this. And it's like Jesus was, was giving us a, a, a foretaste of what's to come. Even though we couldn't have it yet, we could certainly taste and see that what Jesus offered was so good. I, I want to show you something that I'm really proud of. Uh, this is my wife's wedding cake. It's not her wedding cake, but it's a wedding cake that she made for Tom and Christy Howard's son, Hunter, and his new bride, Kelsey, who were married last weekend in California. And my sweet wife went all the way out to California to bake this cake. Now, I know you can't tell what kind of cake it is, but it's lemon flavored with a lemon buttercream icing. And I had the terrible job of sitting in the kitchen for two days watching her put this cake together. But a beautiful moment came when my wife brought the spoon with the icing on it. And she said, Pat, I need you to test this. And I thought, no, no, I'm not going to test this. Of course I want to test it. I could take a bath in it, really? And so as I began to taste this icing, and I was able to tell her, no, it's not tart enough. No, it probably needs a little more of this and a little more of that. And Deborah wanted to get it just right. But the most painful part of this whole experience was watching this cake sit there the entire day, beautiful, ready to eat. But I knew, I knew what it tasted like. You see, that's what Jesus is inviting the disciples to do through not worrying. Look, we know what this tastes like. We know what the kingdom of God can really be like. And I'm going to give you just a taste 
You see, God's got this because God is sovereign. God's in this because this is God's space. And it's not about singing a song that says, don't worry, be happy. No, Jesus is saying, don't worry, be hopeful. Put your hope in the one that never fails. Well, preacher, that's a lot of good language, and I appreciate you telling me, you know, why we don't need to be fearful or why, but how do we do this? Well, let me give you a little illustration that somebody told me and showed me several years ago. And here's the thing. After we're through, I seriously want you to go to your broom closet and try this. Uh, get a broom out because a few weeks ago, all of you were getting your brooms out and standing them up in your house like a bunch of weirdos, and it all was all over social media about how your broom stood up on its own. By the way, the broom never stood up on its own in my house. Maybe that's because I have foundation problems. I have no idea, but I can guarantee you this. There is not a person in the world that can balance this broom on their hand while looking down. Not a person, because as hard as you try, you cannot have any kind of focus if you are looking down. How do you know God's got this? How do you know God's in this? You look up. And as you look up, it brings focus. It brings a steadiness to your life. It brings an assurance that God's got this. God is in this. And as long as you keep your eyes there, but as soon as you take your eyes off God, man, you're going to feel like your whole world is coming down. So here's what I know is true. What I know is true is that there's a word that God wants to write on your heart as you're in your home as you're longing to be with people, as you may not even feel the physical connection with your family, much less your church family, know this. If you keep your eyes on Jesus as a disciple, if you keep your eyes looking up, you can be confident that God's got this and that God is in this. Let those who have ears to hear, hear the words of God.